Volunteer reader to do 20, verse 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Uh, remember that this uproar is happening at, at Ephesus. Um, are they were fighting over Artemis? Nobody knew why they were there. They were just having a good time in the riot. The the the, the mayor of a town comes in and says, We need to settle this down because if this gets any worse, Rome will take our freedoms away. Everyone listens to that. It settles down. But we pick up in chapter 20. Luke says in chapter 20, verse 1 through 6, the following. Anyone please go ahead and read those six. Because the Jews made a long plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Amphiarius, from Berea, Aristocrat, and Stupendus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and I, I taught you. From the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas, but we sailed from Philippi after the feast of unloved bread. And five days later, one of the others of Troas, where we stayed seven days. All right, so one of the reasons why Paul alters his plan uh, to not go to Syria is what? what's happening. He feels a need to leave Ephesus and go elsewhere, and his plan is to go where in verse 3? Well, before that, he wanted to set sail for Syria. But what stopped him from setting sail for Syria? Another route. The, um, how was he aware, made aware of the plot? against his life the holy spirit or the holy spirit working through others to report um this possible conspiracy against him so the holy spirit can work directly to paul and it can work indirectly through human beings remember there was the time there where a lady reported to the centurion that paul was in trouble and paul got message and he also bamboozed so he does not take the route that he wishes to get to Macedonia, to go through Syria to get to Macedonia, but he decides to go back through Macedonia and reverse course. Notice all these disciples that um, are accompanying him, um, these men that he picked up over the course of his missionary trips, quite a few of them from Thessalonica, uh, Derbes also, Berea, um, and from the province of Asia, they went on ahead and they waited for us at Troas. So who is us referring to? <laughs> I didn't finish recording. Um, well, this is going just a minute. Okay. <laughs> who, who is us referring to? Who are the us? Well, 
verse 5. It's first person plural. So apparently it's the author of this book. Who's the author? Who's the author of the book of Acts? Luke is there and Paul. So these guys go ahead of Paul and Luke and they wait for them at Troas. But they don't meet people at Troas until they celebrate what? The feast of unleavened bread. Now, Paul doesn't say, or Luke doesn't report where that feast was celebrated. According to Jewish customs, the feast of unleavened bread was to be celebrated where? Jerusalem. And it's not really clear that that was celebrated in Jerusalem, but they celebrated it a distance. Finally, the group joins together. On uh, verse 7, at Troas, what takes place? 7 through 12. Volunteer for 7 through 12. These words are a little bit easier. you got one difficult name. There were many lambs in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sat into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down to the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed. For his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eat, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, <coughs> and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little drunk. So, what's the moral of the story here? Don't fall asleep when the pastor is preaching, okay? Because if you do, you may end up dead. <laughs> One level church. Uh, don't rely on miracles with me. <laughs> God may not give me the power to bring you back. Um, why did this guy fall asleep? Yeah, countless hours. It's kind of fascinating. This is the only instant where Paul seems to probably have gone on too long. It wasn't a 10 to 15 minute message. No, it was not the 10 to 15 minute message. And I guarantee you that if after Paul's sermon was done that day, if they had these flashlights, they wouldn't be doing this to that sermon. Um, that was quite one sermon that definitely was over the top. Um, this is happening in Troas. Luke sees and witnesses this. How does the young boy come alive again? Yeah, he's don't be alarmed, he's alive. Um, is he actually dead? Verse 9 How do you how is Luke translating this story? Does he look dead or is he understood to be dead? Taken up dead. What was the probable reason why he died? One more stronger. One more stronger from the fall. So, don't be alarmed, he said he's alive. Then they broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he kept talking. I don't know. I mean, what is it about Troas that just Paul couldn't stop talking? Something. Caffeine or something. But he just seemed to not be able to control his speech. In verse 11, after he brings the man, the young boy back to life, what do they do? How's it said that they what? Broke bread and ate. Uh, that phrase, broke bread. What does that mean? Did he celebrate the sacrament or did he just have fellowship? Fellowship. More likely just fellowship. It didn't seem like it was in context of worship. So yet the body of Christ finds value in fellowship. 
He had to feed him, well, just like Jesus did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and Jesus had the same issue, right? Feeding them 5,000. And then Philip said to Jesus, look at them. Uh, where are they going to find food for all these people? And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. Philip says, I only got a couple things. How's that going to feed all this? Uh, and then Jesus feeds them, takes care of them. So there's there is a value in the, in the fellowship in the Sermon on the Mount value here in fellowship. One of the important pillars in our church vision is is fellowship. What what is it about fellowship that's helpful to the church? And why should fellowship be a priority in the ministry? Two or more gathered, Jesus is there also. That's kind of more in the context of worship. But yeah, and what is what what does that do when you get to know people more personally? What does that do? It builds relationships, relationships family, support. support with one Unity. another, Unity. Hmm? Unity. Unity and trust, and trust factor. Yeah. It it there needs to be a fellowship that takes place out the context of worship, because in the context of worship, communication. Is more vertical or horizontal? Vertical. And in fellowship, the communication is horizontal. And you know how it is. You need both vertical and horizontal in life to be full. Yeah. So we cannot just have a church that's only concerned about the vertical relationship. The church must also have to be a church to be concerned about the horizontal as well. Uh, breaking bread and eating, we find that in the book of Acts, not just here, but in other areas as well. So what takes place after Troas? Let's pick up there, verse 13 uh, through, wow, that's a long one. Um, verse 13 through 21, we'll break it up there. So Paul doesn't jump the ship with Luke. Why does he go on foot? Verse 13. Why does he why does he go to Assos on foot rather than by boat? What would you kind of surmise in verse 13? What would be the purpose of traveling on foot? No, the boat would be faster. Yeah, it'd be a witnessing journey. And also it would be a little bit of chance where he's by himself. Solitude. Um, did Jesus practice solitude? Whatever he does. Yeah. yeah. Solitude is helpful. I mean, you got the fellowship, that's important, but sometimes it's good. It's good to be alone, but not good to be lonely, right? There's a difference. It's good to be alone, but not good to be lonely. <laughs> not good for man to be alone. So they rendezvous at this place. And why doesn't Paul just want to go to Ephesus? He makes the Ephesian elders journey to see him. Why is it? Why do they have to go see him rather than him going to see them? What's he trying to do? Where's he in a hurry? He wants to get to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost because if you're going to celebrate Pentecost right, you celebrate it in Jerusalem. 
This is interesting. So you got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, not really clear. He's supposed to be in Jerusalem, but it doesn't seem clearly that Luke says he gets there. But for some reason, he wants to make sure he doesn't miss the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, what's celebrated during the Feast of Unleavened Bread? That is parallel to what week for us? Feast of Unleavened Bread parallels what in the Christian calendar? The Holy Week. Holy Week. It's kind of interesting for us, that would be the big holiday. Feast of Unleavened Bread here parallels our Holy Week. And yet Paul doesn't seem to be clearly in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate this wonderful event. But he doesn't want to miss Pentecost. He wants to be sure he's there. A couple of reasons why Pentecost is valuable to the Jews is not is it only just their Thanksgiving, which it originally started out to be, but over the course of time, it became their Independence Day when they became a nation. Because on the Feast of Pentecost, over the course of time, it became an opportunity to celebrate what? The giving, you guys remember that sermon I had a couple weeks ago? Celebrate the giving of, what did they believe happened 50 days after they left Egypt? Moses received what? The commandments of God. So those commandments basically was a covenant agreement between the people of Israel and God, which made them therefore a nation. When you and these pilgrims came over into America, what bonded them together as a community? What did they put up together? Come on, trivia, historical people. The Magna, Magna Carta. They, why was the Magna Carta important to the pilgrims? Why did they believe they needed the Magna Carta <clears throat> to survive in America? You, I know you can got this one. You got this one. Because the Magna Carta provided what for them? Rules and regulations of how they're going to work as a society. The Ten Commandments creates the society for the people of Israel. The Magna Carta creates the society for those pilgrims. What do we have? Is that the compact? Well, thank you for my correct. Thank you for correction. My my story is off there. So it's the Mayflower Compact. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Google gets me every time. Um, that's good. But what is what is the document that keeps our country together as a society? Constitution. Constitution. Bill of Rights are in there. Um, so here on Pentecost. Paul wants to be in Jerusalem to celebrate the founding of his Jewish nation, even though he's Christian. He asked, therefore, the elders of Ephesus to come to him because he's very close to the church. And because he is, they, they come. So verse 22, he's in a speech with the Ephesians elders. Let's go from 22 now to 38. Go ahead. Now compelled by spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warned me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I finish the face and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you young men whom I have gone about preaching, the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For that, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. But be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from now, even from your own number of men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I have never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. 
Now I commit to you, God, in the word of his grace, which can build up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not covered anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands are mine. I supply you, supply my own needs and needs of my companions. And every and everything I did, I showed you that I that by this kind of hard work, we must keep the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he said this, when he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept and embraced them and kissed them. And grieved them when what grieved them most was the statement that he made that they would never see him his face again. They accompanied him to the ship. All right, so Paul is saying this cheerful goodbye to the elders of Ephesus. And he gives witness and testimony to say, you know, I vindicate myself. I've not done any harm. I've not done anything where people can accuse me of any wrongdoing. He has supported himself throughout the ministry. Um, what is the move, moving factor, verse 22? What moves him to go to Jerusalem? Spirit. That spirit. How strong is that spirit? Very strong. Was Jesus ever in need of being compelled by the spirit? Temptation. I really kind of find it interesting. Mark makes it clear that there was a compulsion. On Christ, just as Paul experiences this compulsion. Take a look, at, you know, keep your fingers on, on Acts 20, but go to Mark chapter 1, uh, if you could. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 12, we'll need various translations here. Um, it's just a very short sentence. What does one translation say about the role of the spirit of the temptation? The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Drove. Pretty strong word, isn't it? ESV. Drove. Anybody else have a different verb there? Sent. The actual Greek verb is actually driven, compelled, like there was really no choice. Jesus had to go. Um, the Spirit and Christ have this interesting relationship throughout his ministry. And it's one that is not really fully understood through uh, biblical studies whatsoever. Where does the Spirit play a role in the life of Christ? Here you see that he was the one that drives Christ into the temptation. There's another situation where the spirit is involved in something else about the life of Christ. Who was the one that drove Jesus to the cross? I mean, we hear that Christ offered himself, right? But can somebody Google the phrase, the spirit offered, it's in Hebrews. If you could quickly Google the spirit offered the sacrifice and see what that comes up. To look in Hebrews, I don't know exactly the verse is. I think it's Hebrews 12 somewhere. But can someone give me a quick Google on that? That the Spirit offered the living sacrifice or something about the Spirit offering offered Christ. Anything coming up? He offered himself through the eternal spirit as a perfect sacrifice. What God chapter is that? 914. 914. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there the Spirit is involved. Who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God. It was asked that Jesus could not offer himself on his own accord. He ought to offer his self through the Spirit to make the sacrifice. The relationship between the Spirit and Christ is phenomenal. 
and not really fully understood by the human being. So you got the spirit driving Jesus into the wilderness, and it is only through the spirit that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. Now we go back into Acts 20 and understand, therefore, the power of the spirit. It's not to be taken lightly. Donna? If if the relationship stays the same, you would think so, that the Spirit is driving Christ to the cross. He's the one offering, Jesus is offering himself through the Spirit, that it would be there, yes, but it's not really clearly stated in the Gospels, as it is clearly stated in the temptation and in the sacrifice of Hebrews. Yeah. Now, isn't there a point where Jesus asks God, Ask God not to make him go through with that, but says if it's God's will, he'll do it. Yeah. I don't think it was the Spirit driving Jesus to the cross. I think good. he made the decision. Good, 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 to good question. God's will. Good, good question. And uh, this is the years of study uh, that I've been working on this spirit anthropology thing. The Spirit in the Godhead himself, up there, the imminent trinity. Does the spirit possess, is, is the spirit inside the, the pre-incarnate Christ or in the relationship, does the spirit just kind of rest on the logos, uh, the, the spirit of the pre-incarnate Christ? You know you have a Christ existing before he's born. So the spirit is in this relationship between the Father and the Son. Does the spirit totally just go and absorb the essence of the of the pre-incarnate Christ, or does he rest upon the pre-incarnate Christ? The, the, the correct word is he's going to rest on it. He's not taking possession of the, of the pre-incarnate Christ because he doesn't need it. The, the, the logos, I'm going to call the pre-incarnate Christ, the logos is already one with the will of the Father. Whatever the Father wants, the logos is, says, amen, amen, amen. But remember, in the salvation, what does the Logos have accompanying him to the cross? He doesn't, he has a body. And this is the point. He has a body. So what does the Logos know what the will is for the person of Christ to do? The Logos knows that Garden Gethsemane is, he's supposed to do what? Go to the cross. But the humanity of Christ, his other half nature, is doing what? Bidding to get out of it. And who is the one that possesses the humanity of Christ to drive the humanity to the cross? The Spirit. The Spirit is not in the Logos, but the Spirit's in the humanity of Jesus, because it's the humanity that's going to be the weakest thing to go. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, who wants to go to a cross as a flesh and blood creature? The spirit needs to dwell in the humanity of Christ in order for the humanity to be obedient to the will of God. The Logos in Jesus is gonna be obedient no matter what because that will is one with the Father. It's the humanity that's gonna drag its feet. And what does that humanity need in order to get to the cross? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I like what the gospel says in the baptism, and the spirit rested, rested. So what is taking place in the imminent trinity takes place in the trinity on earth. Whatever happens up there between those three happens the same way down here. Uh, the spirit rests on, on Christ the Logos, but it dwells in its humanity because that humanity doesn't want to go to temptation. That humanity doesn't want to deal with the pain of the cross. When you think about it, humanity may be dragging its feet to the temptation because to go to the temptation, what must the humanity experience in the temptation? How many days did he go without food and water? 40 days. So humanity was going to have to experience hunger pains. It didn't want to do that. So who had to push it out? The Spirit. Yeah. 
Logos, ready to go. It's flesh and blood, I want to stay back. Spirit needs to drive that flesh and blood with the pre-incarnate Christ to go to the devil. It needs to drive that flesh and blood to go to the cross with the Logos in order for it to be. I mean, because in actuality, in Romans chapter 5, which, did you read your portals of prayer today? Yeah. If you go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 19, see what actually Paul says saves mankind. Um, Romans chapter 5. It was in the portals of prayer this morning. Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 12 or 19. Um, actually, verse 19. All we have to read is verse 19. Romans 5, 19. Whereas by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So what is the factor, according to Paul, that makes us righteous? Yeah, but the word that he uses is obedience. Obedience. What did Jesus have to be obedient to? Death on the cross. What made the blood of Christ the atoning factor for us, according to Paul? What made that blood atoning, what made it perfect for our atonement of our sins was the obedience of Jesus. If Christ was not obedient, would that blood have done us any good? No. The power of the blood, which of course is in him, but the power of the blood comes from the obedience of Christ. If he ever had failed one step, and carrying out the obedience of faith to the cross, he would not be the perfect sacrifice for sin and his blood would not be atoned. So the foundation of the power of the blood lies in his obedience to the cross, just as Paul says it does right here. Um, so this is a little bit of the relationship of the spirit and how the human nature needed to be driven to this obedience because if the human nature stood alone, Without the spirit, what would probably have happened? The plan would have failed. Think about in the Garden of Eden. Did Adam, was Adam created enough to stay faithful to the being of faith in the garden? No. Because he was not the Logos. Even though he was not the pre-incarnate Christ, he was a man like you and me. The spirit was in him, but in order for any obedience to take place, it seems this way. Faithful obedience is going to require the working of the two together. You can't, the locust is not going to do it on his own. He needs the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not going to do it alone. He needs, he needs the pre-incarnate Christ. The two of them together work to make it happen. If they were to do it on their own, there would be something that would go amiss as it was in the Garden of Eden. Um, because the spirit was in Adam, but not, not the pre-incarnate Christ. So the spirit along with Adam falls in the Garden of Eden, but the spirit along with the pre-incarnate Christ makes the obedience happen. The spirit is a very powerful partner in our justification. And unfortunately, I think in much of our Christendom, we don't give the Holy Spirit his due. We, we, we focus so much on, on Jesus, which is okay, but there needs to be a little bit of a balance to say, hey, the spirit did something too. It did something also. Yeah. Um, let's go back into Acts 20. <clears throat> Paul has given his farewell speech, and what does he say that really uh, he knows that the Holy Spirit is totally what awaits him is prison and hardship. But what are the phrase that really makes him cry? Verse 25. What does he say that makes him cry? They won't see him again. What do you mean? You're, you're, you're okay. But Paul says, I know I'm not coming back. And I know this is the last time I'm going to see you. We've had a great relationship for three years. We've got 
really great unific here. And this is it. I won't see you until I see you on the other side. And it, it made him made him tearful. In verse 28, what does he say may happen to the church after his departure? There's going to be false prophets. And he tells the elders, what does he call the elders in verse 28? He, he gives them the name of what in verse 28? Overseers. Overseers. So an elder in the book of Acts is not an elder in today's terminology. An elder back in those days would be equal to what office? Pastor. So these were pastors. <clears throat> and he also uses the word overseer. What does that mean about the authority of a pastor? Overseer. What's an overseer back in those days? And not only just a shepherd, but he was the one that was watching over the slaves and making sure they did their job. So the word overseer was communicating to the elders that they had some authority. They had some authority. What is the issue today about this authority? Um, it communicates that the office, not necessarily the individual, but the office of the overseer should be respected. If a pastor is addressing you from his office about something you are doing wrong, or if a pastor is addressing your congregation about something that it needs to accomplish, how should you how should you take that? How should you take that as a sheep? Yeah, it, it, it needs respect. And it needs to be understood that he's got the office. The, the Lord is speaking to us through him. We don't dismiss it just because we don't like it. Um, does that mean you have to blindly follow these guys? No, you can't dismiss it because you don't like it, but you need to pray about it and consider it whether or not these things come from God. Remember when Paul went out, look at you, Pastor Finkie, it's like, remember Paul went out to the Bereans? What did the Bereans do when he went and preached to them? They went and checked what to make sure what Paul was saying was true? The scriptures. You always got to check to make sure your shepherd, if he's going to speak an authoritative role and position, is in line with the scriptures and what you believe you think the Holy Spirit is saying too. There should be a unity taking place between the pastor and the sheep on what God's will is. I was just thinking that what we need to do is to make sure that that person that we call the overseer is really called by God to be in that position. Right. Of which the people in Berea, whatever, did by always comparing everything to the scriptures. Right. So we need to examine that also. But once we're positive that this person is that, then we need to follow all the things you were just saying. Yeah. The main thing is, is the congregation's not going to go one little as a body unless it has one W-I-L-L, -L, one will. And it is upon the pastor to figure out what that will is as he's in dialogue conversation with the very sheep in the church and then surmise it and then present it and hopefully they all fall in line. Yes. Spiritual care. But then he goes on, which he obtained with his own blood. We look at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ that we um, obtain this with his own blood. Yeah, and I think First Peter also says something to the pastors that they need to be careful um, with. Uh, 
their authority. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter five, verse uh, two through four, and it kind of helps explain what does Luke mean by the word overseers to describe the pastor. Chapter one, five, verse two through four. Anybody read those three verses for me, please? All right, so what stands out to you is how should an overseer be relate to the sheep in these verses? How should the overseer relate to the sheep according to what Peter says here? Yeah, not warning. Have you ever run to pastors once in a while that got that, what they call in the German, Herr Pastor attitude? Heard that? Herr Pastor? That's that's a title that some, yeah, it's a title of lordship that, you know, you don't disagree with me, I am a pastor. And they hide behind their collar and they hide behind their office and says, I'm in charge and I have the power, you just have to listen to me. That's when they're lording. And that's totally against what the Bible says. Pastors exhibit a, a, a lording attitude. They're in the wrong. Instead of lording it, what does Peter say? They how, What kind of approach should they use? Humility. Humility. Being examples to the flock. So I know when I first received the call here and I came, uh, I didn't really stand in front of people at the very beginning. I mean, I have to acknowledge that, okay, this is new to me. I've never, I had five, six calls before I got here, declined them all, but I've never actually had experience where I took a call and then uh, go through learning a new congregation. So one of the things I did in my first few, five months here is I just sat and observed. I just watched the people on the sheet who was saying what, who seem to be respected in the church? Who seem to be sometimes, unfortunately, ostracized and separated? Who need to be letting me know that they're welcome to this community because it wasn't really happening? I just watched because I kind of thought that if I were to come in without knowing the sheep, I'd probably have a lording attitude. That's not the way I want to approach the ministry. So I let leadership develop. E.F. Hutton says what? E.F. Hutton. What's that? But what's it? Yeah, you 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 don't you earn it. What's it say that? I can't remember E.F. Hutton saying it was years ago. Can't remember what it was. You don't. What was it? They didn't say what he said. People listen, but there was another one. There was another line before that one that said, you, you earn it. Listen to learn, learn to listen. Yeah, you earn it. I don't remember what the line is, but I, I learned that lesson when I was a teacher. Respect's not given. Yeah, respect's not given, you earn it. And that's exactly where I'm going, is back in, back in the 1950s and 60s, as soon as you were a teacher in the school and you had the title Mr. Rabel, just because you said Mr. Rabel, that carried authority, right? Now, when you enter a classroom in 2023, when you go in with just Mr. Rabel, do you get automatic authority over your children? Yeah. What do you have to do with kids today? They're not going to give you respect. They have You have to earn it. It's no different with adults. I felt that I'm going to need to take five or six months to earn the respect of the sheep so that they would know that, that where I'm coming from is I care for them, compassion for them, and care for their welfare and their being. So if they want to knock me for not taking leadership roles immediately, let it be. But I need to know who I'm leading and I need to take the time to know the family. So um, 
First Peter chapter five is very, very valuable to me in understanding how I'm going to relate with the people under my care. And that's what Paul says, you know, uh, watch over them as overseers of their souls. Um, because who's going to eventually probably show up in church, according to Paul back into verse uh, uh, 29, who's going to come after he leaves? Wolves. They're going to distort the truth. So be on guard. And uh, this then comes to a sad end as they begin to realize, Paul says, this is it. We're not going to see him again. And the truth of the matter then comes in, and let's just look at 21, 1 through 10, 1 through 11. Chapter 21, 1 through 11. And when he had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Tara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned to <coughs> When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy, Ptolemy and, were greeted by, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we departed and we came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Okay, so Paul is uh, in journey to Jerusalem and uh, they sink him by and they head out there. He's into Caesarea now, really, really close to the city. Um, What's fascinating in verse four, chapter 21, is who are the people speaking through to discourage him from going to Jerusalem? Who's the agent, verse four? Spirit, now wait, I thought Acts 20, 22 said the spirit was telling Paul to go where? Where? Where's he supposed to go? <coughs> Jerusalem. And according to 21, verse four, the disciples were saying through the Spirit that they he should not. All right, you guys go talk amongst yourselves and figure that one out for me. This one is a mystery. How can the Spirit be in contradiction of itself? I don't know. Situations have changed. I, I think basically, if I'm going to take a guess of what Luke is trying to communicate is, when he says through the Spirit, they really felt that this is what God's will was. But it wasn't. Because immediately after they were thinking this was God's will for Paul to avoid Jerusalem, a prophet comes up in verse 10 and says, what's going to happen to Paul if he goes to Jerusalem? He's going to be bound again. All right, so now other people are saying, see, you shouldn't go. And verse 12 through 14, how does this how does this end? Go ahead and read those few verses. How does it all end? When we heard this, we commanded the brothers that it should be with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be persuaded, he gave up and said, the Lord will be done. All right, so verse 12, what pronoun is being used here? We mean, who's involved in the lead? Who also is asking Paul not to go to Jerusalem? Luke. Luke is like, don't go. So this is what's going to happen. Can you not see this is not what God's will is for you? And Paul is, Paul is broken. You know why he's broken in verse 13? Why is he broken? Who should, who should be, out of all the people in the world, who should be offering him 110% support? These are the disciples. What are they doing? They're undermining him. They're undermining him. So Paul says in verse 13, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I don't need you to discourage me from this. I need you to encourage me to do this. Up until this point, He was Paul, leading. Paul listened to the Holy Spirit. Right. But in verse 10, he's changing his ways. He's not listening to him. You think, you think Jesus is communicating with him? Go, go, go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, here the Spirit says, This is going to happen to you. But doesn't because it's going to happen to you doesn't mean Spirit says, Don't go. I'm just going to let you know what's going to happen to you. So you are still to go. But Luke and the disciples are like, We don't, why don't they want Paul to go? Because they don't want to lose him. It's, it's a relationship thing. And Paul says, I'm not only going to be bound, but also if the Spirit wants me, I'm going to die there for the name of the Lord Jesus. And no matter how much they had argued, what happened in verse 14? Eventually, at the end of the argument, God's will be done. I'm going to finish with this thought. This was my text for the last Sunday I preached to Faith and Demand. I thought, oh, for 31 years, that it was time to break the bonds. And the Spirit was calling for me to break the bonds and, and head on down to Texas. And there was a lady that joined the church just before I got there. I mean, not, not before I got there. A lady that joined the church just before I left. And uh, I'm, I'm contemplating this, and, and Torrin and Cecilia and I are torn apart about it. She sits down with me in the narthex, and she says, it, it, Pastor, I really believe it's time for you to go. And she says that in, in a, not in a negative way. She supported me in the ministry. But she just said, Mike, the Spirit is telling me, you need to break. And this one family that I, I kind of served when I, all those 31 years, the mother had buried her son, buried a grandson, you know, for her. And, and when I announced it, she hugged me, gave me tears and says, I understand. There was other people that were like, you're not to go. Had some people say to me, that if you are to leave right now, you are abandoning the ship. And when people would tell me that, that's when I felt like Paul. I need your encouragement, not your discouragement. And if the people's coming to office and says, I support you. And after I made the announcement for the Bible class, a lot of was just one of those heart-to-heart -heart talks. And there was a guy by the name of Tony Nanbor, and he got up and he said, look, it was like the Spirit was just speaking to them. He said, I really like Pastor Abel too, but the Holy Spirit has talked to him, and we need to let him go and say, the Lord's will be done. I thought, wow. I felt the Spirit speaking to, through that man that day. I really did. And that lady that said that, she really believed it was time for me to go. You know what she presented me with 
on on the day of uh, the last Sunday of the year. The last Sunday I preached there on this text, you know what she gave me? A yellow rose. And I thought, I mean, I had a hard time getting through that sermon, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, I had a hard time. But this was the text and it was like, yeah, it, it sometimes sometimes the spirit just says you gotta go. And as we see with Paul, the Spirit compelled him to Jerusalem. The Spirit compels Jesus to the uh, desert temptation. He compels the Jesus to the cross, and and it really believe like one pa pastor Fluga, who was down here just last summer, his consultation to me was: you have to take the call when you can't say no. You take the call when you can't. You decline the call when you can't say yes. And so when I got this, like I couldn't say no to him. So that was, I, I received some great counsel from the sheep at Faith as well as some colleagues there. Um, but it was, a, it was a cheerful goodbye. You know, I haven't seen people, I haven't seen people in the church for, for years. And uh, one of the things that Pastor Flukap did tell me is once you leave here, you cannot come back because it's not going to be healthy for the church. But he, he gave me a time span. He said, he said, don't come back for five years. So we're heading up to Indiana this uh, summer. <laughs> and guess, guess what on the clock? It's been five years. So I'm thinking, Cecilia and I, when we head up, maybe we'll go from Indianapolis and take the two hour drive up to DeMont and just pop in. We've seen people up there, but I, I felt bad that I'm not able to see others that would like to see us and just catch up with us, but hopefully, you know, we can go there and worship without creating too much of a uh, scene, creating too much of a scene. So I'm looking forward to an opportunity to actually have that experience again. Uh, that's that's it, but I just want to kind of say, you know, sometimes when the spirit leads you to make decisions in life, it can be a cheerful experience, painful as well. But in the end, you know, the Lord's will is always right. Let's close with prayer. We Father, we ask the Lord for continued blessings as we seek to discern your will. The Spirit, O Lord, is the great discerner of your heart. Send us, O Lord, therefore, your Holy Spirit as we seek to discern your will for our lives and for the life of Christ the King as we move into the future. We thank you for so many blessings you bestowed upon this church. We ask, O Lord, that in your grace you would continue as we hold blessings upon the present and the future. Help us always to be attentive to your Spirit's voice as we move forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.